Good evening, everybody. With the posted time having arrived and a quorum of members present, I'll call the Public Health and Safety Committee meeting for Monday, April 22nd, 2019 to order. The first order of business on our agenda is the minutes of our previous meeting from 3-18 of 19. Um, copies of the minutes were in the packets. Any revisions necessary? If not, a motion to approve the minutes would be appropriate. Motion by Peckham. Is there a second? Second. second by Herbst. Further discussion? Seeing none, members in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. The minutes are approved. Item number two is to consider approval or denial of various license applications, um, including renewals of liquor license establishments for the 2019 to 2020 license year. Um, there are no recommended denials for this evening. Um, you'll notice that um, uh, there are uh, a number of events. Uh, mobile vendors are on for this month. Um, there's, uh, let me just see, one item um, we've got the folks with us tonight to discuss is a special event um, at Timekeeper Distillery. Um, they're requesting a um, special event, a spring fling, in conjunction with the previously approved Class Two um, for the Love of Music 5K, um, hosted by the Wasa Conservatory, and that's coming up on April 27th um, this weekend. The request includes outdoor mu music on their property in the parking lot and some food trucks, and they are here to discuss that. Um, discuss that, and so um, in some discussion in the clerk's office about whether or not that event needed a separate permit, it was decided that they really didn't need a separate permit. But um, there was some question as to whether or not there's a road running through that property. And so if you'd walk us through your event a little bit and we can yeah. go from there. Um, so I apologize if some of this is redundant, but I just want to make sure everybody gets an accurate picture of what we're looking at. So sure. Spring Jam event, um, the Wasa Conservatory is hosting a 5K on Saturday that will start and stop at our facility. Um, there will be a tent in the north parking lot as well as porta potties um, and that the private property actually starts right at the edge of Grant. Um, so there wouldn't be any through traffic or anything during that time. Dan and I thought it would be a really great opportunity to kick off spring open our patio um, and have some live music for our guests and the community to enjoy free of charge. So a couple things with that. Um, our event will start at 11 a.m., which will be right immediately after the 5K. Um, food trucks will arrive around 11, and then we have our first live entertainment in the tent outside at 11. So he'll play 11 to 1, um, and then our big event will be Unity the Band. They've played on the 400 block. That'll be from 2 to 6. Um, business as usual commencing at 6 p.m. Couple key details with the event. Um, all neighbors have been notified of McClellan and Grant that are within that area of the event, what it entails, timelines. Um, those were sent out a couple weeks ago. Um, there will be porta potties and a tent secured to ensure that we kind of contain um, what we have going on. We will have someone doing wristband checks um, for those coming into the event because we will have the outdoor beer trailer um, that has mixed cocktails on it as well. So I know that was something we wanted to discuss mm -hmm. was uh, the permit with that. Our general premise under the state of Wisconsin permit we have for manufacturing alcohol covers us to serve the mixed cocktails not the beer, so that's what we wanted to talk about today. Um, so wristbands for those over 21. Um, there will be an area for beer service. Plastic cups will be used outside. And then we will have a skimming process in place if needed. So a lot of our POS transactions are actually credit card based. So just talking about public safety, there won't be a lot of cash on site. If there is a need for a skim, I have internal safes um, to put things as well. So we don't have a lot of cash outside to create a uh, distraction. And then post event, we'll do lot sweep and clean up to preserve the area for the neighbors um, and those passing through. So I believe, like you said, the one thing we really wanted to discuss was a beer service outside. Um, and I do have a couple extra things. Wasa is listed as additional insured, like we talked about, uh, for the day of the event. So I have the paperwork if you do need that, as well as a copy of the letter that I sent to the patrons um, and the neighbors in the area. Yeah, we would need a copy. Yep, I have that for you. Okay. All right. And now with the beer service, um, for a special event, I think the committee does have the um, ability to approve um, outdoor service for in the context of a special event, separate from a permanent outdoor area. Um, and Timekeeper does also hold a Class B beer, do they not? I thought that we had we licensed do. them for beer. Yeah, yep, they do. It's in their premise, though. It's not to the parking lot or anything exterior of the building other than a patio right. on the east side. So just like we've done with other um, outdoor parties. entities, ex yep. exactly. That's what we're looking to do here. Okay. So that's one thing, I guess, that we'd be asking to do committee with the batch. Um, if your desire is to approve the batch, that we would also stipulate in the approval that um, for the um, single day event, the timekeeper would be allowed to have that service and that outdoor music. 
Uh, let me just see. Was there anything else we needed to take separately? I don't think so. I see item number three in the staff summary report is Nev from Ajri, um, surrendering their license to a new owner. Um, the Liquor License Review Subcommittee met today to consider that. Um, when uh, Nev um, changes over ownership, they will surrender their license, and then the recommendation is that we would award that license through this action today um, to um, Fourth and Main LLC doing business as the milk merchant. They indicated their operation at the store would be largely similar to what's going on there currently. And uh, they'll have a couple weeks of closure for some remodeling, but uh, it didn't sound like anything would be too different there. And the subcommittee did vote unanimously to um, recommend that we would allow for that um, surrender and reaward to take place. Uh, let's see, anything else that we need to take separately? I don't think so. Does anyone have questions for any of the events or any of the licenses that are indicated in the packet? If not, uh, a motion to accept or deny licenses as recommended would be appropriate. Mr. Peckham. I just have one question on that Family Fitness Fest. Uh, I didn't see a location on that. Is that 400 block? 400 block. Okay. Okay. I'd move to approve this okay. batch. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a motion on the floor to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. It. Second from Herbst. Further discussion or questions? Hearing and seeing none, members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. That motion carries. And uh, then item number three on our agenda is to consider the request of Mary Jane Opper, um, formerly doing business as Cheers, for an extension for good cause for the liquor license to the end of the current license year, which would be June 30th of 2019. Um, we'll note that um, Cheers, um, bar was um, purchased uh, to make way for the Thomas Street Road project and so at that point um, that would cause the closure of Cheers and I believe while they're trying to decide if they're going to set up shop elsewhere or or where um, they want to do that they're asking for an extension. Is Mary here? Okay Mary Jane if you'd like to come up and talk to us a little bit about your plans. Um, I really don't have any plans right now. Plan, um, I just would like to extend the, um, you know, just the license and keep looking until the end of June. Okay. And so with that, um, the committee could allow an extension for good cause like you do with um, uh, under the abandonment ordinance where you give them an ex uh, extension um, to get open and get operating. So if they're looking for a new site um, to perhaps reopen, um, you could, um, as a committee, allow for that um, extension for good cause through June 30th. That's the end of the license year for the license she already has, but with the stipulation that you would not renew it on July 1st for the next year if there's no clear plan or no location. Does anyone have questions for Mary Jane? Okay. If not, do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Peckham. Is that a motion to ex to extend with good cause through 6:30? I see no reason why we shouldn't uh, approve this. It's a couple of months and it's paid. It is coming up quickly. It's paid for, and uh, that would give her some time to seek out a location in the area. Okay. Is there a second? Second by McElhaney. Further discussion or questions? Seeing none. Members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. Thank you for coming in. Okay. Um, item number four is a request for permission to have outdoor music, a live band at Athletic Park on July 4th, 2019, and the requester for that is Mark McDonald. Um, you'll recall the last couple years um, they've hosted the Red, White, and Boom event at Athletic Park, which has included um, uh, live outdoor bands. I think in past years those haven't been a problem, and they end at a reasonable hour before the fireworks begin. Um, I was just Go going to add that anything else that has to do with um, Athletic Park and the park that is next to the facility, he is working those things out with the Parks Park Department. Department. So okay. this is only portion just the, that... Just the alcohol part and the band part? The well, band the alcohol, part. he doesn't even have to. He's right. got a just, license. So. Just the band part. Just yep. the band part. Okay. And I think last year we approved him for this as well because there Correct. was a couple of bands out there. Yep. Um, do we have a motion then to um, approve this event for Athletic Park? Motion by McElhaney. Is there a second? Second by Herbst. Further discussion or questions? Seeing none, members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. That motion carries as well. 
Item number five is to consider request for permission to have an outdoor party on July 27th at the Eagles Club. Uh, requester for that outdoor permit is Merle Kelch. He's with us this evening. If you want to come up, Merle, and talk to us a little bit about your event. <coughs> Welcome. Hi. Um, just a couple things. We at the Eagles Club, and, and uh, I'd like to stop just with a, uh, a brief summary. The Eagles Club in Wausau, many people think somebody owns that, and it doesn't. The Eagles Club is a non-for-profit uh, function and has actually been in the city of Wausau for 116 years. And so with this, we raise money at our facility to literally give it away. Now, it has some facility we use in there, too. So for the past three years, we've been having functions in our baseball field. We don't play baseball in there anymore. I'm not going to run the bases. That was an attempt at humor. All right. So we've been having functions there not only for Man of Honor, but for the Eagles Club as well, where we'd regularly have two or 300 people, outdoor tents, music, and adult bit. And this event is really no different other than we just have a bigger name band. And it's our intent to have music from about 2 o'clock until 10 o'clock when the cutoff time is. And so we've had liquor at all these events. I'm sorry, not liquor. We've had beer at all these events. And so what we'd like to do is to ask, what do we need to do so we can actually have liquor in this event? Uh, we understand we probably have to have higher fencing than what we have because it's all enclosed as it is now. Um, how do we do that for this one day? I didn't realize you wanted liquor at this. Is that what you submitted into Yeah, we us? actually sent it for an email as well. We uh, uh, sent it into, um, I believe it was Mary when we sent in our liquor license and so forth. Yeah, it's kind of like the one-day party. Like, can you is, it like, is it like the one-day that it's, we've got it's to like the one day party, party and all like, that? Uh, distillery is asking, like, um, yeah, pretty much the know, same thing. They're just... So they're they amending their premise, so to speak, area. for that one day. Right. So we have a uh, we have a baseball field that's fenced, and we have to make it higher so people can't see in. We have our friends at the uh, Marine Reserve is going to come in and uh, uh, help man the door. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, they said, "Can we take anybody down?" We said, "No, you, you can't do that." So they're really kind of excited about that part. Uh, we'll get uh, a couple police officers down. We think that just only makes good sense. So we want to have it so we can serve cocktails within the uh, uh, the confines of the baseball field. Of course, there's only four points of entry, and they'll all be governed by uh, people standing at the door and wristbands for uh, those that are 21 and up. And is there a plan to wristband the attendees to verify age? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, they're not getting in without it. Okay. All right. And uh, outdoor music you had mentioned. Um, what time does outdoor music start and stop? Um, Oh, I don't have the start time. We end at 10 o'clock, just like we always have with the, with the city. Okay. I did receive your email, and I put on the memo to the committee that the event will open at 11 mm -hmm. with music beginning at 2 and completing at, at 10. 10. Okay. Right. And yeah, we, we might open a little bit sooner. Um, we have people coming in. We're asking them to bring in their lawn chairs and set up wherever they want to. Mm -hmm. We'll have avenues and you know ways to get in and out, uh, obviously chalk, down, chalk lined down in the grass. Um, but 11 seems to be our reasonable starting time. Mm -hmm. It's our first mm -hmm. time, so we're not exactly sure how all that will function Well, perfectly. and with other but, events, even with church gatherings, and things I think we've asked for outdoor music to stop between 10 30 and 11 so your end time seems reasonable yeah we so. stopped at 10 um, I'm certain it'll be okay if it's a 10 or 10 or 10 or 5 yeah. or something like that but yeah, uh, 10, yeah 10 we want to make it 10 probably not a problem so. uh, most of the neighbors uh, around the neighborhood we we let them know in advance as uh, as well as um, we have cleanup crews going by and ATVs to clean up the whole neighborhood and that whole bit mm -hmm. and many of the people from the neighborhood are members of our club so okay all right, and then with the event permit, maybe what we'd want to do is, does the entire event end at 10? Yes. Um, okay. Well, we haven't really thought about that. Or does the band stop at 10? The band starts at 10. Or stops at 10. We really haven't thought about that. If people want to sit around and have a drink afterwards, I think that's fine. I think in the past we stopped at 12, didn't we? We shut everything down inside at 12. Music stopped at 10. I'm trying to remember. We're going from our, our man of honor and our corn okay. roast we've had in the past. I think sure. we shut the music down at 10 that it uh, naturally fizzled out, but we stopped mm -hmm. serving drinks usually 10, 30, or 11 afterwards. And hopefully okay. some people want to come inside of the club and, sure. and have a drink for the rest of the night. As long as we have a you know firm stop on music at 10, usually yeah, otherwise you absolutely. get neighborhood complaints. Yeah. But I think other than yeah, that, the times seem reasonable. The chief's nodding. So, All right. Um, with that, um, do we have a motion then to approve this party as, it, as outlined? Motion by Herbst. With is there the a alcohol. With the alcohol, yes. Correct. That okay. is, is that included in the motion, Don? Yes. To to allow them to have the outdoor alcohol service and the outdoor music, as long as the music is done at ten. Yeah. Okay. So that's included in Don's motion. In M Mr. Peckham, was that a second, or B Becky? Second by McElhaney. Further discussion or questions? Seeing none. Members in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed. None are opposed. Motion carries. Thanks for coming in. Thank you all. Yeah. You bet.
Uh, item number six is to consider the request of John Jacobs and Keith Malwitz doing business as Jay Gumbos for an extension for good cause for the liquor license to the end of the current liquor license year, June 30th, 2019. Um, do we have anyone here representing Jay Gumbos? Both. Okay, if you guys want to come up, talk to us about your plans for the business. Good afternoon. Um, we are relocating out of our present location in downtown Wass on 3rd Street, and we're just looking for another location right now. So we'd like an extension granted to us to help us uh, give us a little more time to keep looking for another location. Okay. And you're looking seeking that location in Wassa? We are looking at all the different options in the metro area. It would include Wassa because Wassa has been good to us to start with. So Sure. Okay. And then this one, much like Cheers um, Committee, if you decide to approve this one, you'd need a firm commitment or an establishment to license by by the renewal date. We wouldn't renew it in July without it, absent that. So that gives you a couple months to work things out. Um, do we have a motion to approve that? Or are there, I should ask, are there questions first for the owner? Yep. Okay, do we have a motion? Motion by Peckham, is there a second? Second by Herbst. Further discussion or questions? Seeing none, members in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed, that motion carries. Thanks Great. for coming in. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Item number seven, discussion and possible action to amend section 5.72.120 special rules for pedal cabs. And Jeff is here. He's the one that's asking for this. Okay. Um, um, come on up, Jeff, if you'd like to talk to us about your plan. I think we had met with you last year and you were in the process of developing a business plan. Yep. yep. Um, right now the time is at 1030 and I requested for an hour and a half later at 12. Um, my reasoning is for, um, you know, my business plan, first of all, and then um, I think that it would provide a little bit more safety for um, members of the community instead of, um, you know, traveling from bar to bar. Um, they have another option, um, which is my pedal cabs. Okay. And where to refresh me, I guess, um, either Tara or somebody from the clerk's office, where we left off with, we did pass the pedal, pedal, pedal cab enabling ordinance last summer um, because we didn't know if, if Jeff would be the um, proposer or if there would be someone else interested in starting that type of business. So the framework of the ordinance is done. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so the request here is just for the time amendment because I don't see it in the packet as far as what we've got from him. I I guess this just came forward as far as I know. It, it was brought to my attention today when I came into the office mm -hmm. this afternoon, so I really am not aware of. I think the way I heard about it was an email, is that correct? Yep. Okay. yep. Sent it to Mary Gady? Yep. Okay. Um, all I had in here, I just took ex excerpts out of his email um of what he what the ordinance describes is that nothing after 10 30 p.m and he would like to extend it to 12 a.m reasoning is twofold one he says it makes more sense for his business plan model and two it provide rides from bar to bar instead of a person well, risking driving tony my understanding is he, he hasn't even applied no. for a license yet no is that there's right? nothing other than the ordinance and um that's it okay so that said, you know, I think that we, I think when we passed the pedal cab ordinance, if memory serves, the reasoning that we went, went for a firm stop at 1030 is um, for safety of the people that are being hauled and safety of the motoring public that's on the street with this vehicle. Um, just because it's essentially by nature, it's a slow moving vehicle um, and you know, we were hoping that it would keep similar hours to what the pedal pub does and that it's not out there so late and, you know, close to midnight and approaching bar time. So, you know, if, if we were to amend this ordinance, that then amends it for any applicant that comes along. And so if we are, we haven't had one of these licenses yet, so we have no experience with them operating in traffic. What I would like to see happen is if you're going to start this business for this season, apply for the license try it within the confines of the original ordinance. And if you find that there's no motor vehicle issues, there's no safety issue, they've not been um, problematic in any way, we then could certainly consider an amendment once we have some experience with you know, managing this process. I, you know, last year we created the framework 
in advance of your business plan or anyone else's, but we have no pedal cabs operating in the city right now, so we have nothing to rely on as to whether or not the core ordinance works or doesn't. You know, and that just that's just me as a committee member. I don't know what the rest of you feel, but I think we should try it before we start uh, cutting and pasting. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, uh, I'm with the committee chair on this. I think uh, let's try it at 10:30 uh, and see what happens. And like she said, we could uh, consider. But I'd also like to hear from the police chief as to any opinion that he might like to share with us on this. Yeah, I think I would I would agree with uh, with Ms. Rasmussen. Um, I don't I don't have any information to go on to make a recommendation that midnight is better than 10:30 or vice versa. So um, I. I don't have a strong feeling either way. I think we had a, a discussion around why we decided 1030 initially and without further information as to why that would be better for this for the city or for the citizens. Um, you know, maybe we should stay status quo for now. Okay, Pat, go ahead. I think the uh, reasoning on the 1030 could be summarized by the later it gets, the drunker it gets. <laughs> yes. So. so I, I guess just because the um, new framework is completely untested, I think we should try it with the original structure first before we would make amendments. But you know, after you've been at it for a season and we've got some experience to rely on, um, then we'd certainly be open to um, this request in the future. But we've got no experience to say yes or no with yet right now. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. So with that, no action is necessary on the part of the committee if we're not going to amend. So thanks for coming down. Thank you. Uh, okay, that brings us to item number eight, discussion and possible action to approve the city of Wassa flood plan. And we've got Bill Hebert with us on that. And uh, you've got a copy of this um, flood evacuation plan in your um, packets. And Bill's going to walk us through this process a little bit as far as um, why it's prudent for us to have this plan. Um, we don't have one currently, but probably should. So welcome. Thank you. Um, Phil Rentmeester with the Marathon County City Emergency Management oh. is here as well. Um, Welcome. Hi, Phil. Hi. <clears throat> so we, we um, got a map over there, actually. But uh, as part of Bring the map up. Go as ahead. part of the um, latest and greatest floodplain ordinance that we had to adopt mm -hmm. with the DNR, we have um, a map here of the properties in the floodplain the whole city of course but anything in blue is actually within the 100 year floodplain uh, and anything in the green is 500 year so in, in order to permit to allow permits in these areas for significant improvements we have to have a floodplain ordinance or a flood evacuation plan in place with the DNR so if this if the city street is also in the floodplain so most of this is going to occur down by the hollow Okay. Oh, sure. Public, public works, um, the Eagles Club, that area. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had some interest in some vacant lots down there, and in order to even consider giving them a permit or uh, going through that process, the city has to adopt a flood evacuation plan. So we, we engaged with Phil to help develop that and guide us through it. Okay. All right. And so the recommended plan, um, the plan that's recommended for adoption is in your meeting packets. Um, it's fairly sizable. Um, does anyone have questions for either Bill or Phil about the plan? Go ahead, Pat. One very easily answered one, but I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know what page it's on, but uh, and as a pre-flood uh, objective, uh, they recommend developing chimney drains, and I have no idea what that is. What the heck? I talked to uh, Rick Molineski about that as well. That was one of the things that Department of Public Works does, and maybe the fire chief can remember as well what that description was that we had in our meeting that we were planning. But it, essentially what it is, what I got out of it, is that they either build up around the, the drains, like a chimney, around it, and it's supposed to either stop the water from going down into that area. It's kind of a, it's just creating a pipe in that area. It's something that they know, they're familiar with it. It's a task that they perform. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Pat, I could uh, I could elaborate on it. I think it's the storm sewer is connected, obviously, with the river. So when the river rises to a certain elevation, it actually will go back up that storm sewer and and start flooding the, keep the neighborhood. Storm. Okay. So they chimney it to try to make that um, water balance so it stays 
within that chimney but around the uh, curb stop mm -hmm. and back you know back into the river and wow. send it to Mosinee. Mm -hmm. To try to mitigate some of that overflow if it was going to happen? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I was also, uh, if I may, um, I was surprised that Central Bridge Street is in a susceptible area. Is that that low? Yeah, that's um, that's mostly in the 500 year, which is not. Um, it's mapped, but it's not regulated. Okay. So. Okay, and then there was. Um, in the. I had no uh, inkling going into this that I would have anything to say about this because it looks very thorough and um, well thought out. Uh, but in the uh, draft public announcement message two, uh, it says, the second sentence, it says the area of the hollow or the wastewater treatment neighborhood should consider evacuating to higher ground. And I think there are probably people who are living in the hollow that don't know they're living in the hollow. So I would um, suggest- We could maybe amend that and reference it by street. Or by yeah, zone. I think you would, you know, and I, there is a, later in the document, there's a reference to the location as being generally south of Thomas and adjacent to the river, but I think you could say um, south of Adrian Street and east of Empter, or, you know, something along those lines. I think that if you're putting a, a public announcement out there, you have to make sure that people are going to understand it. I think that would help. But otherwise, wow. Okay. So, assuming that we would add that um, descriptive change for you know what area is defined by the old reference to the hollow, um, is there a motion then to accept and approve this plan? Motion by Peckham. Is there a second? Second by McElhaney. Further discussion or questions? Seeing none. Members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. None are opposed. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. All right. Um, and Bill's going to stay with us because the next item is his two. Item number nine is discussion of, repe of repeal and recreate section 16.040.030 residential rental contract registration. Repeal section 16.04.039 residential rental licensing and create section 16.04.030. Uh, residential rental inspection and you'll recall probably five or six years ago um, the city of Wausau as a result of the efforts of the housing code enforcement task force um, passed a rental licensing ordinance and during the time that the rental licensing ordinance was in effect um, rental homes to get licensed were subject to um, cyclical inspection and that effort actually revealed and caused to be rectified many issues um, with rental property that would not otherwise have been discovered um, because sometimes a property doesn't look so bad on the outside, but the inside is in a state of complete decay. And so that said, um, the, a number of stakeholders um, decided to spend their time and money um, down in Madison to change the state law um, pertaining to municipalities' ability to regulate rental property. And so that said, um, that caused um, some changes down in Madison um, legally that um, forbid or I guess preempted municipalities from licensing rentals anymore. And so we, we preempted enforcement of our rental licensing ordinance um, pending an alternative that would be compliant with the new laws. And so as things have evolved, Bill and Tara have been working together um, to find a reasonable alternative that's compliant with the state law um, that still would allow us some access to rental units in certain zones so that we can um, carry out some of the mission of enforcement that was underway prior to the suspension of the rental license program. And I guess, Bill and Tara, if you want to walk us through kind of how you got to this point, there is a map in the packet showing the rental unit density as far as how many there are. I mean, you see the purple dots on your map there in the packet. Um, there's a lot of them. And uh, so I guess if you want to just walk us through. This item is on for discussion only. I guess I want to be clear that we won't make any final decision here tonight. We want to talk about it, decide if the committee is interested in pursuing this course of action. And if it is, then we will finalize a plan and bring it back for a firm vote um, and uh, allow some time for um, community reaction as well as committee and council reaction before we press forward. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, 
guess as Mr. Rasmussen alluded to, we got a map. We got three maps in the packet, I believe. This is just outlining where the rental properties are in the city of Wausau. <coughs> the multicolor one, the red and green, this is what we did in, in two years of uh, rental licensing and rental inspection. These are actually inspections that were completed by our staff. There's over a thousand properties that were inspected. I, we didn't we didn't factor in the number of units yet, but we did over a thousand properties in the two years that we had it going. And that mostly um, is in what we call District One at the time. We broke the city into three parts. It was Sherman Street on the south, Bridge Street on the north. 10th Street on the east and basically 10th, 10th Avenue on the west. And then there was a few outliers where some property owners wanted to do some rental inspections, so you see those on the outside. But mm -hmm. for the most part, we hit, we hit up District 1 pretty good. We're ready to go to the next one. And um, we slowed down because of the uh, legislation that passed. So now we're we also had some staff changes recently, so we're, we're back to full staff and uh, geared up to possibly do some rental inspections. So we, we thought we'd come to the committee and <coughs> offer uh, a possibility that we could do a district where we, were, we would do a 15, 20 block district and just focus our efforts on that area, doing exterior and interior rental inspection and then uh, see what, what results we get and how long it'll take and then move, you know, hopefully get through that timely and move on to the next one. Would the plan require that the committee and the council approve each new zone as they're formed? So when you exhaust one zone, you know, in a year or two or whenever, and then if we want to refine the boundaries of what the next zone will be, um, would we then approve a new map so it, that you could move into a new area? Yes, yeah, it would, we'd come back every, after we got, got through every district and have a meeting with you with this group okay and Tara if you want to walk us through this well one of the things I was going to just clarify that Bill's touched on is in order to um, establish a new district we'd have to be able to to find make a finding and demonstrate that that area is experiencing blight or mm -hmm. a decrease in property values things like that so it's, it would be tailored to the conditions in that area so the um, ordinance that I drafted is uh, you know it's fairly simple the rental licensing was was a little more detailed and complex this is a little more straightforward the first thing that we're proposing is uh, redrafting the rental contact registration ordinance we already have that ordinance it requires landlords to um, contact the city and provide us with an agent or contact mm -hmm. information for themselves the difference um, between this and what we have now is uh, we were requiring it annually now with the changes to state statute you're only looking at having people initially registered which many people already are and they would not be required to re-register if they're already registered with mm -hmm. us but any new changes then if they've changed agent if there's a transfer sale of the property they'd have to give us that new information and there would be a one-time registration fee for that if you're not already registered or if there's a change in registration so that that one's pretty simple the uh, residential inspection rental inspection program that district would be defined by resolution um, that would start here and then go on to the Common Council I think Bill's done a lot of research on on the different areas and presented that information to you and what are the boundaries of the proposed zone for this next cycle because I see there's we've got three maps but sure um we we haven't um, we'd like to stay away from where we were in district one since we we did such a thorough job it appears on that area that I, I described previously mm -hmm. um, staff had considered and rec would recommend probably the athletic park area 
it looks like that's kind of about where you stopped before. You know, if you went from there to the, you know, whether you went all the way to the north city limits or whether you went out to, you know, Campus Drive or wherever, there's still high density above where you were before on the map between the two. It looks like. Yeah, and we will have to come back with that. Um, to topic. define the to right. define the boundaries. Yeah. What are your thoughts, committee, as far as um, reestablishing a program that you know allows them to at least periodically get into um, some of those units for inspection on the inside and outside and and try to remediate some of those issues? Go ahead, Pat. I don't want to gush, but. Uh, I guess my only misgiving on this is that I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, I think it's the most wonderful piece of legislation be to come before the city in the last year at least. I think it's great. Anybody who touched it should be thanked and congratulated. Um, it's really good um, and I loved seeing it. Um, and the only question I had is why properties owned or operated by the city of Wausau or its community development authority are exempted. And maybe that's because they do their own inspections or something. But. Well, that's sort of a carryover from our original rental licensing ordinance. Most of the, pro well, the properties that we have that we rent, all of the Riverview Towers and Terrace, those are governed by HUD and HUD inspections, so that has its own whole layer of inspections. So essentially um, there's an inspection protocol or Those provision. properties are inspected in okay. connection with HUD. Golden, yeah, love it. That said, I guess just as a matter of adhering to one common set of standards, not to say that their HUD inspections are, I mean their HUD inspection is probably way more detailed than what we would do, but I guess just the optics for the public on um, you know what happens when public housing gets exempted you know the average landlord or apartment association or whatever the first question they may ask when we go to something like this is how come the stuff the city owns is exempt shouldn't ours be as good or better than whatever else is out there and you know I think that's a discussion that we could have also when it comes time to um, approve a final product but even if they're going through their HUD inspection as a you know separate matter of operation that they're required to do I think that you know, just so that there's a level playing field among owners and among landlords, if we also are a landlord, our stuff should be good too. And I think that, you know, we should show to the um, rest of the um, landlord community out there that we're not afraid to be inspected either in terms of public housing. So we may want to talk about whether or not we want that exemption anymore in our final product. I also what? love uh, the last line that uh, this can be fulfilled with existing staff. I love that. That's because with the last plan, we got an extra inspector. <laughs> so that helped, though. It, it did help to have someone that was dedicated to going through those units, and they found an amazing amount of stuff in those first few years. So, and you know, that triggered then um, the development of rent abatement and a few other things that you know have proven to be very successful here. So, I guess if the committee is interested, and that's what. Um, Bill and Tara are looking for from us tonight is if we're interested in pursuing this path which would essentially recreate rental inspection in a manner with which is compliant now with the new state law do you want to go down that road and if your answer is yes they'll continue and they'll bring you a finished product and a finalized map at a future meeting are we are we can agree by consensus you don't have to vote on this one so we all they, they all look like they're agreeing by consensus so Please continue, and we'll see you in a few months. Whenever you're ready with your new product, bring it forward. And the benefit of this lease is that we're hoping, you know, with the meeting tonight, that landlords will be able to hear about it and be able to give any comments and, you know, any kind of input that they feel they need and so mm -hmm. they don't feel this is a surprise. Well, that's true, too. I think any time that something like this, if we were to take final action tonight and then have none of them present, and have none of them except for um, that guy. Oh well, yeah, well, here. that's true. Yeah, Mr. Fisher's here, so but but that said, um, you know, they they've not had time to chew on or digest any of this and I think the first plan um, certain caveats of that plan were very much opposed by the landlord association. So, I think that um, if we have a reasonable and legal alternative, um, it makes sense that we would at least gauge our interest this evening and make our decision at a future meeting. I would expect that if we wanted to make that decision just so there's some time for 
um, to distill out public opinion, maybe talk with neighborhood groups, that we'd maybe want to do that in our June meeting. You know, not even in May, but probably do it at the June meeting, which should be the third week of June. That way it'll have, you know, if there's neighborhood groups that have high rental density in their areas, if they want to talk about it at a neighborhood group or if, you know, they want to have a chance to talk with their council person or if we want a chance to talk with our neighborhoods and our, our landlords and our tenants, that we can do so. So would that be a reasonable time frame for your development of your, of your plan, June? Or do you need more time? No, it's, I, I mean, if... People are generally satisfied with the draft ordinance. Um, all I think Bill and I need to do is fine tune the area and come up with a resolution and get okay. whatever input that the community has to offer. Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you. And let's see. Item number 10, discussion and possible action, amending section 8.08.011 .08 definitions and section 8.08.010, .08 certain creatures forbidden. And you'll recall a few couple months ago, we undertook a um, discussion of a proposed ordinance um, that um, had a, well, essentially a ban on some creatures in the city um, that are typically found um, in wild settings. It started with a, with a pet fox and it's kind of, didn't end there. Um, we had an exhaustive list of little creatures and critters, and we had uh, sugar gliders in to visit us at the meeting, and we asked for some comment, and we took an awful lot of written and verbal comment um, from the animal community um, asking us to perhaps go back to the drawing board and retool this a little bit, and so Tara did that. Um, she went back and did some research, and in your packets, you've got... Um, a lengthy memo from her outlining the differences between each alternative and I'm going to have her walk us through those because even though they're in the packet um, the public and those folks that you know watch us on public access didn't have the um, luxury of having to read through all of that in advance but I think that we have some decent alternatives and I think that there's a couple in there that would represent a fair compromise and so if you want to walk us through that a little bit Tara we can at least start our discussion and Go from there. Well, one, one of the things I wanted to say is I don't know if you remember the young lady who was here from Stevens Point mm -hmm. the last meeting. Her name was Megan. I can't remember her last name offhand. I was looking for it. Um, she was very, very gracious and spent considerable amount of time with me on the phone um, just talking some things back and forth and it was very helpful and and I did appreciate that their input she was very gracious very professional very informative and and I did want to extend a thank you to them for that I'm surprised she's not even here so mm -hmm. um, so anyway with that in mind so the new alternatives that I came up with, we had alternative one and alternative two already, if you recall. The first alternative allowed sugar gliders um, and constrictors, uh, not more than six feet. Mm -hmm. The second alternative was no sugar gliders and no constrictor snakes. So the third alternative allows the sugar gliders um, to come back in to be in, in, in the city. We also um, tried to, this time, instead of giving a numerical limit on constrictor snakes, tried to phrase it in terms of any kind of snake or crocodilian that might inflict physical harm or is capable of inflicting physical harm to humans or domesticated animals. Um, so it's, it's not as specific, it's more based on a reasonable person standard or a reasonable person's um, thoughts about what might be capable of inflicting harm. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of ordinances, statutes, laws that are written in that sort of fashion. Some of our dog statutes, state statutes are written that way, um, Ashley can can take an animal and hold it for cause if it's uh, imminent danger to the public safety or something along that line. So it's not completely unheard of. The, um, and I tried to come up with some kind of a definition um, so how people would understand what that might mean when we say capable of inflicting physical mm -hmm. harm. And 
there aren't any other ordinances that I saw from other communities regarding wild animals that have this kind of language. I kind of pulled it a little bit out of different kinds of statutes like OSHA. OSHA has actually a good definition of like what um, first aid is and things like that. So I thought, well, if it's good enough for them, it's certainly helpful for us. Mm -hmm. So what I did was um, I tried to define physical harm as any injury that requires medical treatment beyond first aid or includes death or injury. And then I tried to define medical treatment as those more significant uh, medical care aspects like surgical care, hospitalization, use of prescription medications, um, use of wound closing devices like glue or sutures, something, something I guess just as a off the cuff, something that's a little more shocking, um, you know, when you see it, that's an injury. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you have a critter or a, a, a snake or something that gives you a little bite and it just requires something like um, soaking, flushing, cleaning, putting a Band-Aid on it, that we're trying to distinguish those kinds of cares and treatments from something that's more serious. So it doesn't prohibit anything off the bat, but I suppose as, as an off-the-wall example, I mean, if, if as a prosecutor, if I see somebody with a 12-foot crocodile that has all its teeth and it's living in someone's bathroom, to me, I would have no problem prosecuting something like that under this ordinance. Now, where you get into the gray areas, that's why we have the court, that's why we have officers who exercise sound discretion, um, that's why we have an animal control officer. So um, what, where that limit is for crocodiles, I, I can't say, but it's like pornography. We might know it when we see it, right? So alternative number four takes a different approach, and what we tried to do in that respect is allow somebody to apply for an exception. First off, we allow any kind of uh, constrictor or crocodilian, uh, any reptile that doesn't exceed 10 feet in length. And that sounds big to me. Uh, Madison has that in their ordinance. So, you know, we're not out there all by ourselves. I wonder mm -hmm. what is our second biggest city. So that's what they have that seems to work for them. And um, you can apply for an exception if uh, if you convince, can convince the committee, the city, that you have adequate way of housing that animal, keeping it confined, giving it humane treatment. It's not going to get out and endanger and terrorize the public. Mm -hmm. So there are two sort of different approaches and I, you know I'm not sure I there don't seem to be a lot of reptile people here today I, I don't know if they miss these versions or they seem well, to hit a, a more palatable note for them I, I think that both of the new alternatives um, are certainly uh, a more positive step for people who were um, somewhat shocked by the first two and so you know in reading them um, we have in the past, and I think I was intrigued by Alternative 4, because in many other things, we have allowed, on a case-by-case -case basis, people to apply for an exception permit for things that are not allowable in every home everywhere. And, you know, when I think about pet fanciers, when I think about um, uh, urban chickens and things like that, there are, there are things people can get a permit for, but there's a higher level of inspection required. There's a different, there's an approval process that needs to needs to happen and so you know if we wanted to give ourselves a little flexibility and a little leniency that we can allow to folks who are capable and qualified and have acceptable containment for an item like this alternative four would make some sense because it, even though it's a permit process it wouldn't be widely used it's much like some of these other things like I've described not every household is going to apply for it I mean if you get five or six well you know, that's kind of what happened with urban chickens. I mean, in the entire city, we've got like 12 or 15 permits. So, you know, I think that this isn't like throwing the floodgate open to allow everything of every size, but I think it would give us some flexibility as a committee. Um, what are your thoughts? Becky, go ahead. 
I agree with with number four. I know that in speaking with um, the the snake people, uh, you know, and that, that the people that had emailed me said, if you need something, you know, some kind of barrier, they would think a you know some kind of a licensing would be better so somebody could look to make sure the animal is taken care of as much as the public i do have a problem because it looks like all venomous animals reptiles arachnids and insects are still included now we did have uh that megan and there was a, a problem because the hog nose snakes which is very very apparently um you know they a lot of people have them you know mm -hmm. that is is one snake that is popular among snake people and it is considered a rear fang snake so under you know specific issues it would be considered a venomous snake and and i i know that i had asked that question of her and she said that's a good question because that's not going to hurt anybody mm -hmm. but it is still classified under the the animal species as a fanged snake which would be considered a venomous snake mm -hmm. so i have a problem with that if we're you know i think that there were other um uh, here we go. I mean, I, how many problems do we have with this? Are, is this, we had a fox, and then it turned into this, and I know that I'm going to have a problem with somebody keeping, I don't know, a spider. I guess people do that. People do. And people do. is that a public health and safety issue? I don't know if it is. I mean, we don't have, I don't, in talking to my residents i can't say i mean they could be skeeved out that somebody has that but is that a public health and safety issue have we had a problem with that number two is that you know i'm skeeved out by rats people keep those i'm skeeved i'm sorry you know I, i'm not that but that's that's somebody's you know they like them and that's you know okay because everybody's different so where you know i guess that's my issue is that i don't want to be over broad in this just because somebody could say oh i know somebody who has one and now i can make them get you know what i mean right. i i just i don't want to do it unless there's a problem but if there's an ordinance stating that all they need to do is be Report it, correct? Correct. If so, they have an animal, I mean, if they have a forbidden animal and, and no permit right. for the new ordinance. Well, yes. there's no permit for these animals that, like that, the spider or the hog nose, you know, which are the rear fanged, which are the ones that, you know, that Megan had, and I had gotten email after email stating those are the most popular ones that people keep. Yep. So, I, I I appreciate the changes in constrictor snakes, but I'm going to be voting against this if those venomous animals are included because I just think it's overbroad for I've learned so much about snakes. <laughs> it's overbroad for that and I just don't want to do that unless there's a problem. Well, and that's the that I guess is my question too. I had a question about rear fang snakes as well because that was one of the points of discussion that we had with them when they were here when the herpetological society came and said that you know even though that is venomous it's usually venomous to its own prey and not to people and so you know that's one thing i wondered as well and i thought if we were going to do a permit you know then that permit probably should not be um uh 10 10 foot plus reptile only um and so that said the process that we would go through to to approve any of these things you know like the the um, rear fang snake or you know whether someone kept a spider or whatever it was the the permit process I think could be broadened to include a few more of those things and then obviously you know like our ordinate like the um, draft says the legal memo says um, the permit applicant among other things would be required to allow an inspection of the premises demonstrate safety measures for housing the reptile or this creature to ensure protection of the public adjoining property owners and the neighborhood and require the applicant to obtain written consent of the owner of the property and all adjoining or diagonally abutting property owners so there is some 
safety containment there that the neighbors know this thing is in this home and that they have agreed that you know this this can happen I mean the way she's got this drafted would you want to in the enabling permit include the rear fang snake or you know those items that there's there's a couple of ways to do this and that's why I did you know I could have done 50 versions of right. this oh, thing totally and, and I really do want the committee's input I am not a zoologist me neither so you know this is this gets pretty delicate there are, there are ways where you can you can incorporate some of the provisions of alternate three into alternate four and say something like a little parenthesis how we've accepted sugar gliders you could do a parenthesis under that subsection one that says any rear fang snake that doesn't present a imminent danger to pets to public, domestic to the, yeah. animals and other individuals I mean there are parts I can take from mm -hmm. one and put in you know a, and allow that we could try and get a list of those venomous reptiles that we don't think pose a danger like the hog nose snake if I put hog nose snake in there I guarantee you 50 people are going to email me tomorrow morning and say what you forgot this one and you mm -hmm. forgot yeah, that one happening. and you know well if the hog nose point, is rear fanged you could just use rear fanged as a class I could use rear fanged as a class and I could say you know any rear fang snake and I can steal my language from number three um, you know that we'll see it it that says um, what is it that doesn't you know doesn't pose a, a, mm -hmm. a risk to other and you know other and other people or or domestic animals mm -hmm. I mean I can take those things out of that and put that in there with respect to the rear fence to so the enabling provision well yeah yeah so, so that and that was the only thing that I questioned as well was um, when we had the herpetological folks in um, that was one of their main concerns and so the rest of the list they weren't too upset about but you know if there was a way that a permit could be obtained and you know some subsequent review you know an annual renewal demonstrating that the public is safe from these things and that they're in proper containment I guess I don't see an, a problem with alternative four if we can um, address the rear fang snakes in the enabling like we've addressed the permit for the reptile so I guess what are your thoughts on that I think you know we've go ahead Pat yeah I like um the way the conversation is going I do appreciate uh, the thought that we don't want to solve a problem we don't have but on the other hand we can with the passage of this we might be able to prevent a problem well I think uh, there's more of it than we know I think it, when we've asked the humane officer she's found all sorts of things that virtue to one that. would wonder yeah yeah and I do like uh, the idea of a permit because that um, allows the humane officer or a designee to take a look at the conditions under which the animal is being kept um, at a brief conversation before the meeting uh, and I made the observation that not very many people give much of a hoot about the living conditions of a snake but uh, if you've got a glass box uh, that's three feet long and you've got a six foot long snake uh, that animal does not having a good life mm -hmm. uh, and I attempted uh, through emails uh, earlier to try to get a handle on what a, a cage or enclosure uh, size should be and I was told that if you make and I don't know how they know this but they well, the person that I was uh, communicating with said that if you make the enclosure too big for a snake that it gets anxious hmm. and uh, I don't know about that but it just seems like you know you're uh, it's an animal uh, that has evolved to live in the wild and we're putting it in a glass box uh, and I think that's a bad idea to start with uh, so alternative four that would allow uh, a representative of the city to check on the uh, conditions uh, that the animals living in I think would be a, a good step and I have no problems with uh, amending uh, the thing to allow for rear fang snakes uh, I think uh, as Ms. 
Alfonso mentioned uh, the delegation from UW Stevens Point was very diplomatic and um, informative, uh, and no reason not to listen to them. So, yeah, I like. I think we should go ahead with this, uh, with the change on the rear fang snakes, and if we want to wait on it a little bit and you know do it at the next meeting, that's fine with me. But Becky, go, yep, I think yep. we're heading down the right I think road. We, I think we are too. Becky, go ahead. Another question: If I have to go back, I want to. Uh, in talking about, are we going to be doing? giving people an idea of what they expect with these conditions or is it just going to be per i you know per the humane officers judgment because you know the chickens we had a very specific hoop size hoop size that kind of thing with the pet fancier is basically her judgment mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. which is fine i mean i just think we should be specific because people like you know something it's got to be either you know, her judgment or whatever. I mean, you. it seems like if we're going to tear mm -hmm. off of this and make permitting, it's going to be a whole nother, it's going to be, it's going to another dimension then. It, it is. And, you know, much like beekeepers and pet fanciers and, you know, all these other things that we permit and that we allow a permit for, um, I think it certainly can be managed. I don't think that it is going to be highly sought after to the point where it creates a body of work that she can't keep up with. But I also think it gives her access. And so when someone applies for one and they agree that they're going to open it up, like Pat said, and show her where the animal lives and how it lives, I think that it's that we are always dependent upon the humane officer's judgment for when something is or isn't happening properly because none of us are animal experts. And even when we deal with vicious dog cases and anything like that, all of our decisions are um, often predicated on her assessment of an animal or how it lives or how it reacts to her because she has that knowledge and we don't. So I think that in this particular case, um, her judgment and her research would be our best possible tool rather than trying to massage um, coop size or, you know, with, with chicken coop, you can measure it and that dictates how many chickens you're going to have. We've already given a variance for a larger one uh, under that provision. So I think, you know, as far as what the containment needs to be, I think the containment depends on the animal. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we could distill it down in ordinance form far enough or clearly enough to cover everything for everyone. And so I think if we would leave that um, uh, judgment to the humane officer and her skill set, and obviously she would make a recommendation as to whether or not we should approve that permit. And I think that all would be part of her recommendation is whether or not she feels that it's properly housed and contained so well and at that point I think when you come here for the permit the animal owner the reptile owner has an opportunity to discuss with you their their housing situation present additional information and maybe um, make people feel more secure you know it's not mm -hmm. just a Ashley says and then no one else gets to say anything the owner right. gets to explain elaborate present Completely. additional information right so every permit for any snake comes here no I mean not any venomous I mean if we're talking ones. about well, well that's that but if oh. we're going to add hog nose I mean that could be if people follow direction well, it could be significant the, and the thing we can do is um, much like we've done on all the other ones is we can allow them to staff issue and so just like beekeepers just like you know a, a lot of those um, permits that we allow now urban chickens those are all is issued by staff mm -hmm. and only when they require special circumstances or when they require a deeper dive into the dialogue do they come here so we so, would have to have a separate paragraph then, correct? Because it well, says here that Alternative 4 provides that an individual may apply for a permit and they need to, uh, has to prove to the committee that the specific reptile is not a danger to health or safety of public adjoining property owners in the surrounding neighborhood. So then, so I mean. So the committee or its designee. Yeah, right? we would and have then, to add something so it's, they don't have to come here, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, we, ha we have similar language, as, as Lisa pointed out, in the B's and... I think it's the committee or their designee. And so then we would designate, um, you know, our staff representative to f essentially review and issue those permits and, 
you know, obviously if one had to be repealed, because what we give we can take back, and if yeah. one had to be repealed, if somebody wasn't holding up their end of the bargain, we'd certainly do that here. Yeah, so, I, I, I agree. I just don't want it to overwhelm. I think I'd rather keep that as a staff level if possible. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering. After the committee has its discussion, please. Go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if we aren't going a little uh, too strong on the uh, proposed requirement for written consent of owner and all adjoining or diagonally abutting property owners. Uh, I don't think we did that with chickens or bees, did we? We did not. Um, and obviously this is the committee's recommendation and the council's decision. So what you have in front yeah. of you are two tools for discussion and for your thought. Yeah. I think so if, but just remember in writing things, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is the public going to be mad that they have some big, huge snake living next to them versus, you know, so Obviously, you can put it in there. It's a tool for you to at least have, have thought about and make a conscious decision to get rid of or keep. Well, and that said, with the other things that we've permitted, whether it's honeybees or a third dog or uh, an urban chicken, none of those are going to kill anyone. So, you know, if this thing escapes well, containment, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just... I put it in there. It's up to you it, guys. It's not my decision. Yeah, you know, it's I just a, a tool for discussion yeah. for you guys. But it might be, um, you know, if it's a six-foot hog-nosed snake or something, it might be a situation where it's quite safe. Uh, but if you give the neighbor uh, a chance to mm -hmm. uh, deep six it, they're going to go thumbs down, and that person is not going to be able well, to have that. That, that yeah. is true, and it does kind of invite neighborhood conflict. That's something that we had talked about because we talked about that with urban chickens also. When we first started that discussion, you know, should we have an abutting property owner awareness of that? And so then we thought, well, does that invite neighborhood conflict, A? And then, you know, B, would an uninformed or underinformed neighbor be fearful of something that there's not necessarily a need to fear because they've got no understanding of what it is. And so, you know, if somebody knocks on the door and says, I'd like to keep a 12 foot snake in my house, well, what is, you know, neighbor who has no experience with these things going to say? They may be naturally afraid. So, you know, that, I guess that's something we have to decide. The other option um, you can consider is consent versus notice or nothing at all. You can require them to just provide notice to those neighbors so that they're aware that situation exists versus consent. Um, and, and I agree, you know, I was not in favor of the consent for chickens as, a, as an attorney. Um, and balancing, you know, my neighbor has a 10-foot crocodile, I was trying to decide, you know, I don't know what neighbors are going to think and how the committee and the council is going to feel about that with their constituents True. that they do or don't have the right to know that somebody has a permit for a 10-foot crocodile in the house next door. So it's a difficult question. Yeah, and then um, I think the idea of providing a notice uh, I think is more palatable than uh, requiring permission, but then uh, if you're going to do that, then you're starting a whole little bureaucracy where we're going to require somebody to provide, uh, you know, receipts for, you know, certified mail that they well, yes, did that. That kind of gets to, to be like the um, notice of public hearing for simple things, like the plan commission. You notify people with 100, within 100 feet, and all of a sudden the person that lives 250 feet away goes, well, I didn't get a letter. And then they're super upset about super upset about that. So you know, I think that's something that we have to massage. I mean, first, I don't foresee that this is going to be like the floodgate opening, and you know, how dozens of households and neighborhoods wanting these. I mean, I think this is going to be a lot like all the other permits, where you're maybe going to have ten of them in the entire city, and the rest of the um, animal owners aren't aren't going to go for things like this. So you know, and that really, and we got to keep in mind, is a permit just for the larger size stuff. You know, the smaller ones up to that 10 foot are already, there's no permit necessary. So only the people who want to do this larger. For just the constrictors. Correct. Are going to be coming in, or the crocodilians, you know, and well, in that said, well, with the rear fangs. Well, it'd be venomous stuff. over 10, you know, hog nose over 10 Is that feet right? as well. Or right. Well, venomous, because it right. says just venomous on here. So are we going to just, um, 
you know. Well, you I think we were going to use rear fang as a class. And, but and are not, you going to allow any rear, rear fang, or are they going to have to come for a permit for even rear fanged over 10 feet? Well, I think over 10 feet is over 10 feet. I think, you know, well, when that's we, what I think. Because that was the one thing we were trying to worry about with the, with the permit was the size. So they would have to come here or to staff in order to get a permit for a an 11 foot hog nose snake. I would certainly think, but okay. below That's that would be a, a, okay. I mean, I'm just trying to. I think below that they should be okay. I well, mean, we're, okay. my understanding I, I of what you okay. wanted I was that would be great, but I didn't know that. I thought that it was then a hog nose needed a you know, no matter what would need a permit is what mm -hmm. I was assuming. Okay. Well, that I can ch that's how it is written now, but I think okay. we're talking we can about create changing that, it sure. so okay. that I can bring something back. Right. And so if we wanted to bring, if we wanted to make our tweaks and, and make our final, dis final vote, ratify a final version, we could certainly do that at, ne at our next meeting. What are your thoughts, Pat? Do you have? Uh, I was going to ask if you were uh, wanting to get this passed and if you were open to amendments, but I think I'm absolutely I mean because I think what we'll do is we'll give Tara all of our uh, Adjustments that we want her to make right. and so when it gets back at our next meeting It'll be a final draft and then we'll send that to the council So um, we do have one person that wants to make public comments and then did yeah. Ashley maybe after yep. that lady and speaks, yep, we can bring Ashley. her up as well. Yep Yeah, I would like to hear from Ashley about uh, the notice uh, part, but uh, I seems like we're leaning toward uh, allowing uh, rear fang snakes, which I think Under would, 10. Yes, under And then 10 permit feet. over 10. And I think if there were uh, an expert in the audience, they could probably tell us that rear fang snakes don't get that big. But, probably. Uh, <laughs> so we probably don't have that problem. But um, if you were uh, asking for a motion, I would move that we uh, ditch the uh, requirement that we get consent from the neighborhood but uh, I don't know that we even need to vo vote on the drafts tonight if we want to make some adjustments and make okay. one final decision okay. you wouldn't have to take voting action tonight yeah, I, um, I like it otherwise okay let's take public comment and then we'll bring Ashley up as well well hi, hi I'm Judy Demashik I'm representing Zoological Association of America um, this is quite a big stride forward from our first meeting um, March 18th I'd like to thank you for that um, there is a couple things though um, if this do does go into effect Have we thought about what you're going to do with all these animals that will have to be rehomed if the people decide not to go through the permitting process to get that okayed? That's a concern um, for animals that would be displaced So well, not permitting them would not be if there's a permit required They'll have to come in and get a permit to get legal or right. they're in violation. So okay, but if it's it's denied by your control officer because of environment or whatever, then what's the process? Then the process is that they have to rehome them or have them outside the city, just like vicious dogs. Once once a decision is made that an animal can't exist in the city or is not appropriate, then they're in violation. So hopefully they'll rehome them and, and well, not just or comply, let them go. Or find a way to comply with the ordinance. Whatever was pointed out that needs to be corrected, if they would correct it. Okay. You know. Um, the other question I had on the exemptions, it's just a question. Um, it says public and private educational institutions are exempt. I guess I really don't understand that because um, if that would be the case, they should be licensed under USDA to be have an exemption in that. So I don't understand why they would be exempt from this ordinance going into effect. We've I'm had, just looking at the exemptions. We've had similar exemption in our current ordinance and so educational I'm not institutions saying that they not do or don't have to be licensed by USDA. That's not the measuring stick that I was using is more a school, a private institution, you know, can right. have those things. But if you were to worry about housing and requirements and sizing for animals, that would be a requirement, and you're saying they don't need that requirement. They're just being not, sent from The it. federal government has its requirements, and they impose those requirements under their own regulatory scheme. Hmm. So, But our permit is an individual permit, and it's a residential occupancy, so... They're separate. Uh, right. We're we're not uh, we're not trying to manage school systems and educational facilities with that though. I mean, we're not undoing the USDA's requirements. Right, but it right just doesn't say license. That's the reason I was questioning that. That's all. 
Um, and sizing requirements that you're talking about, I'm no expert in snakes at all, but if you, there are a lot of places out there that have requirements for snakes. Um, our, our Zoological Association has accreditation standards for all snakes housed, so you can draw upon many, many resources out there that have them. Um, USDA have regulations and size requirements for animal um, housing and um, uh, requirements for them for all kinds of different um, aspects of care for the animal. So you could use that. I don't think a control officer would be the only one to call upon. I don't think they have that expertise um, in knowing if a, a snake is in a proper environment or not. Well, it's all up to them deciding if they think it is or not. They're not going by any hardcore um, requirements. Well, and that's the thing is, is that when we um, delegate that um, recommendation, whether or not a permit or a license should be issued uh, on all of our animal ordinances, the humane officer not only has access to review and inspect the premises and have a dialogue with the owner, but she also then would conduct her own research um, if she does not have the, you know, at her fingertips, the, you know, container size for a particular animal, she would certainly access other resources and not just rely on, you know, some fictitious mm -hmm. number as she manages that. But I think, like I said in our, you know, dialogue, it's inappropriate for the committee to try to um, list in, in, in an ordinance the containment enclosure size, weight, depth for every creature out there you just can't do it your ordinance would be uh, you know 500 pages so you know we do need to leave some of that um, judgment call decision making in the recommendation up to the staff who has the skill set and the municipality when it creates an ordinance like ordinance like this has the ability to um, control what people have and how they have it and so you know we just like we manage everything else urban chickens beekeeping um, you know, all of the licenses we give, the permits that we give, we have enabling provisions for people to have, you know, more cats than are normally allowed in a household, more dogs that are normally allowed in a household. But when a decision gets made and we've reached a maximum or the decision gets made either in this committee or a staff level decision that gets made by the authority of this committee, it's a final decision. And so, you know, that's not outside the community's purview to decide. And so, you know, I, I think that we have the authority to make those decisions, and you know that's why we're trying to manage it today. Oh, I agree with that. I just know that there's sizing for it's just general snakes mm -hmm. constrictors or non constrictors. There are um, requirements of how large a snake is, and it's got to be 25% of their length in addition for additional snakes. So there are provisions to follow. You don't have to create your own. Well, when she is um, able to check, the, it doesn't have to be in the ordinance itself right. in order right. for the animal control officer to investigate and research those standards. Mm -hmm. You know, she has access to that. She also has, a, I think, a, a good communication with uh, the state veterinarian. She has access to the local veterinarians. Uh, obviously, I'm sure if she called Stevens Point and, and the people down there, they'd be more than welcome to oh, for continue sure. to give us assistance in this regard. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you answering my questions. Um, just a, a quick comment on um, the actual process when you do the process, are they going to have any leeway time in order to get the obtained? Because obviously, just think if you have, I don't know how many you have. It seemed like there was a, quite a few people here that had reptiles at the meeting that we were in March. Um, the process to get those okayed, that's going to be a lengthy process. So are they going to have a certain amount of grandfather time to be able to get and obtain that license? Go ahead, Tony. I was just going to say with other things, what we usually do is they would come in and make the application, mm -hmm. and um, we pass those things on to the humane officer, and we go by what she um, inspects, sees, and everything on there. And um, I'm not putting words in your mouth, humane officer, Bishop, but a lot of times if she says things are okay, we can bring it right to public health and safety on the next meeting. If there are any issues, again, we'd bring it to public health and safety. They can work with Ashley. We can do a lot of things like that to expedite it up. Um, with the dog, just for an example, with the dog license, the way it, the state statutes runs is they have 30 days from acquiring the animal if it's over a certain age limit to come in and get it licensed. So let's say it's something like a um, pet fancier. They come in, they apply, they show us the evidence that they need, and 
Um, Ashley's given the information. She goes out and does the inspections. We're not months and months out on looking no. at anything that comes in. So, no. you know, and I think the reason we had such a room full before is we were looking at a total ban on constrictor snakes mm -hmm. in general, regardless of size. So I think in that room, you also had people who were raising them from a very small size to average size. And so not everyone that we saw at that last meeting would certainly apply for this permit, which is to be in excess of the norm. And so I think that's partly why why we would i think we're going to have very, very few of them actually okay so, thank you for your time sure thanks for coming in humane officer bishop do you have some insight for us before we continue our tweaks <laughs> Welcome. um i've got a couple things to consider and i hope i'm not opening up a can of worms on this one <laughs> open away <laughs> we certainly want your opinion um as far as requiring um either the permission or the notice to the neighbors we don't do that for dangerous dogs. See, it would make sense then not to. I think that pet fancier doesn't no, no, either. Nothing for pet beekeeper, fancier's nothing. Beekeeper doesn't. Yeah, so I, I well, feel like that's... The thing is, if you have a dangerous dog, however, we do have requirements. You have to post a notice at your right. residence. I mean, we have other safeguards mm, to My consider. only argument to that would, and I'm the only reason I bring this up is to play devil's advocate because I think it'll be an issue. Um, because of the signs and the kenneling outside, people are aware of it. If it's inside their house, people aren't going to be aware. Especially if it's not something that ever comes out. Well, and, and with our other ordinances, it wouldn't be allowed because they can't be walked outside of the right. property or things like that. Mm -hmm. So realistically, I mean, even now, people don't know about the animals that are there, specifically, you know, the reptiles and things like that. This, yeah, I mean, we if we really wanted to go that way, we could do it. You know, I mean, people probably aren't wouldn't be happy with people with rats. Right. I mean, you know, it just, there are people that don't like that. And so... I just think I agree with her. I think that's just, uh, we're going to start a war. So one of our <laughs> tweaks should be to remove that notice to abutting neighbors and permission provision. Just strike that entirely. I mean, if we don't have it in the other ordinances, I think that's kind of where Pat was heading to start with. Take that part out. Okay. Easiest See, that was, <laughs> she, she just lined it right out in her notes. Um, so. Another thing to consider is I'm not overly concerned about um, having in the ordinance the, you know, size of cages or anything like that. That is governed under state law for proper housing conditions for an animal. Mm -hmm. So we have no reason to put it into an ordinance um, because it's already there. If they are improperly housing their animal, they're going to get denied. Right. Um, and then, well, if they're denied for those reasons, they're probably going to have charges for animal neglect or abuse. So sure. I don't see any reason to try to get that in there. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Do you think we're heading down the right track then, committee? I mean, as far as Tara's made some notes as far as what we'd like to see for next month. I mean, we've opened this up a whole lot from where we started. So go ahead, Pat. So for snakes, there are guidelines on how large the enclosure container should be? Oh, I'm sure the, the American Veterinary Medical Association has guidelines for every species. Um, I am a certified vet tech as well, so I have access to all of that. Okay, that'll help. So, all right. So with that, I mean, we kind of agreed by consensus. You don't have to vote. And Tara was making some notes here for what we want to see and not see in her final draft. So alternative four with some tweaks, and we should be, sounds like we're kind of all in agreement. Okay. If you'd like that next month. Would you like it for May? Yeah, okay. All right. Let's have it then for May. We'll make a final decision in May and we'll view the final draft then. All right. Thank you everyone for your work on that. It's been an exhaustive process, but I think we're heading in the right direction. So um, that said, we've got um, item number 11 is discussion and possible action on creating city of Wassa policy for awarding operators and other licenses and replacing former city of Wassa policy operator licenses. Um, the 2017 policy. And so you'll recall that a while back we had redefined our denial criteria for licensing and uh, the state law has changed and it's allowed people to um, submit verification of um, reform or rehabilitation that we should take into consideration um, either with granting a license or staving off a denial. And we just had one of those at council a couple weeks ago where we had people on appeal um, who ended up with a different decision than they left the last committee meeting with because that law had changed. And so, you know, one we approved, one we upheld the denial on, but we've got some um, new criteria here in front of us tonight that will allow us better to better change, change the process. And it will allow for the review 
of the documentation that people submit, this proof of rehab or proof of reform, to be a part of the staff review before it ever gets to the committee. So as a committee, we won't have to adjudicate whether or not someone's evidence they carried in is enough on the fly. That um, proof would be submitted. It'll be part of the clerk's office and the police department's review. And when that denial or acceptance recommendation comes, they will have already seen it. So you won't have to, you know, take documents from them at the podium and try to read through them and make a decision in like five seconds. So I guess you guys have some stuff that you want to add to the, if you want to walk us through it, either Tara or Ben, anybody who's Go ahead. Come I was on. just going to say we've kind of discussed it a little bit. It's going to take us a while to get the flow the of flow. things yeah. because there is a big time constraint where we get the documents or the application. We need to contact the requester and say there's issues with it. Please send us the forms. We need to send it over to the chief. Chief needs to review it. Let us know if there's an issue or whatever mm -hmm. before we can proceed further. So we're going to try to work together and make this uh, quick. Luckily, process. there's only a few per month. Yes, you know, it's not exactly. like everyone has something. So. Right. And I do want to, I know we've done a couple shout outs to Tara. This was extraordinary what you put together. It is Indeed. outlined that I can understand it, so I greatly appreciate that. Oh, it's very that, detailed. It was wonderful. That Thank you. was Mary. <laughs> Mary okay, Mary. And it said, unlawyer it. So. Un unlawyer it. <laughs> I tell you, we are, well, we are blessed to have all of you because you we, we need it. So Yes, thank you. Okay, well, and we know as a committee, we depend on you guys every month for everything. So go ahead, Pat. Yeah, uh, I don't see anything in here not to like, uh, and I uh, have a sense that I, in the past, we've been several times um, a person before us who uh, just on their own, you know, volition says, I've gone to every attic class offered, and I went to this NTC thing, and I completed this, and all that stuff, and we don't know if any of that's true. Mm -hmm. So if they, um, you know, want to appeal uh, and provide some information, if staff could at least make some spot checks to see if that information is accurate. Um, we had one where uh, it appeared that there had been no uh, legal issues for three or four years, but then it turned out there was a whole bunch of little stuff uh, which was bothersome. So. I think we're going to have better information to make a good decision with this. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything you said, um, Mr. Peckham, but we can only do so much investigative work. You know, we do the, the background checks, and that's where we pull the information from. So if someone hands us something that says they did indeed graduate or fulfill everything with their attic, I'm not going to call, nor is anyone else, I think, call attic to see if it's a legitimate document, has it been notarized, has it got a stamp of approval or anything on it. If they give us the things that are required, I think that's the all fact we can that they with. have a certificate at all, I think maybe is what he's talking about, because sometimes they come mm -hmm. in and there's this long drawn out narrative of, you know, I've done this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and there's not a piece of paper to support any of it. Right. We just have to take that on faith. And, you know, of course, when they come into the committee at 5 p.m. on a weeknight, they may be in a completely different situation than they were, you know, in their in their actual setting where they would be working on a daily basis and in control of a premises. So, and this would be something else. Like I just said, we would have that before before they even yes. came through. But again, it's going to be quick turnaround mm -hmm. to get these things through. Just as a sidebar. Um, in the past, I've seen it many times or I have seen it before where someone says I signed up for this. I'm going to do this. There was never any um, proof that any of that was executed. Like they followed, followed through. through on? Yeah, See? so we really, that's one of the things I know that Chief had mentioned before that we need to look at and say, yeah, this was actually done. It was right. approved. It was passed. Yeah. I whatever. think our process actually gets better now, having that review happen before they get to committee, because so often their presentation at committee is kind of a leap of faith. And, you know, even if they bring you some documents, there's no way for us to adjudicate on the floor whether they're legit or not, or you know, whether what's been done is even relevant or sufficient. So I think having that done when they get here is going to be huge for us. It's a little less chaotic than where we've been. Much more objective. I, indeed. Subjective. It, yes, yeah. yes. I think because sometimes you get down to who tells a better story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, that really is kind of how it happens. And that's sad but true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, we have to keep ourselves focused on the fact that the job they're applying for isn't the only possible job in the world. And that by giving them that job, we're putting them in charge of a place where there's a whole lot of responsibility necessary that, you know, they may be ill-equipped to carry out, but, you know, they tell a good story. And so, you know, then that then when they appeal to the council, it's even worse because then the council hasn't had the benefit of any of this discussion 
and they tell a better story there and then we're in conflict with one another so i think our our front end vetting is going to be much better now would you like a motion to adopt this I resolution i would love a motion to adopt <laughs> you this plan. motion by peckham is there a second second by herbst further discussion hearing and seeing none members in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed none are opposed motion carries and we're almost to the end um, item number 12 operations report for the fire department for march of 2019 uh, I know the chief probably has a couple notable things that she uh, wants to talk about because they've had some pretty big fires lately. So um, a big thank you goes out to them because I know they were on that one at the laundromat there for days. So mm -hmm. that was huge. You bet. Too bad Bob left a little bit in advance because uh, first week was here. We had a, a couple pretty major fires that, well, the one, the Rainbow Fire, obviously wasn't going to get much worse, but we also had a, um, a multi-comp multi-residential complex fire a couple days later that if it would have gotten out of hand and moved uh, from a room and contents fire to a structure fire would have been uh, not very good either so um, both those fires uh, as you had mentioned um, obviously took a lot of work um, and a lot of coordination and uh, we did get help from uh, on the first one from obviously our neighbors as well so um, Several of our neighbors came in with uh, aerial trucks uh, to try to mitigate the rainbow fire. And, uh, um, and then we had some engines that came in too to pump, so. it's excellent. It's a testament to how well departments work together. You know, sometimes politicians don't always work well with their neighbors, but public safety does. And so the fact that you can, you know, go to the box alarm or call for mutual aid and they always come and, and help us when we need it and we help them, that's, that's fantastic, so. And that, interestingly enough, I think we brought that um, before uh, the last um, council, and public health and safety, and then council, we talked about uh, the Mavis agreements uh, when I first got here. And um, I think there was uh, some, um, I don't want to say heated discussion, but some discussion about that and how we wouldn't benefit from that. Um, and you see in our reports, we actually go other places as well. But the fact of the matter is, is that when we need to receive uh, aid, we actually get aid as well. So. Well, and it's my hope that anyone who thought that that um, type of agreement or that type of arrangement didn't have validity sees now that it does. And I think right. also those who, you know, were interested in, you know, perhaps charging for profit for things like aid and, and contract services, I hope that, you know, all of those folks realize in retrospect that if if we get a big one going like you said when you first came to wasa we need our neighbors sometimes more than they need us and the fact that they turn out and help is huge and so i think this this proves that you bet but uh, it was good point yeah go ahead pat the astounding number is the top one on the third page average response time to three building fires two minutes and 40 seconds isn't that Amazing. That's yeah, to be amazing. celebrated. Yeah. That's to be celebrated. You know, and I've said this before, but one of the reasons that we're able to, um, you know, put out fires quickly and keep them to room and contents fires most often and even save structures uh, so people can actually move back into their homes is because uh, we have the response times that we do. Obviously, fires grow exponentially. So, uh, if we weren't afforded the ability to be able to respond in an efficient manner, um, obviously we trained for that as well, but if uh, we weren't afforded that opportunity by obviously being a 24-7 uh, department, uh, we wouldn't have those type of results. Yeah, it's a fantastic effort. Yeah. I have one other thing, Go ahead. if there's no uh, questions on the activity report. I just wanted to mention to you, I mentioned to um, Police and Fire Commission as well is we just went through a 2% fire dues audit um, by the state of Wisconsin and uh, the Department of Safety and Professional Services actually conducts that audit <laughs> and it's done every five years and it's a review mm -hmm. of all our paperwork so our inspections it it mostly focuses on fire prevention and inspect the fire prevention inspection bureau and also training um, so reviewing inspections our ENFERS reporting uh, what, what we do for public education, our training records, uh, mostly all our records. Uh, um, but uh, the auditor came in and actually uh, 
commended us, gave us high uh, com uh, accommodations for uh, the way we, we do business at the Wausau Fire Department and recording what we do. And um, the reason I say this is there's other people and obviously within the department that actually do that for us, um, i.e. the Fire Prevention Bureau, Dave DeSantis, Brian Stahl, Sean Carriger, and of course um, Mindy, uh, Mindy Walker has a big hand in that as well. So um, we walk through that uh, unscathed so I just want to give a shout out to those those people and um, the good work that they do fantastic All and right. that I uh, sorry I Go ahead. the two percent dues uh, last year the two percent dues, dues we we got um, last year was hundred and thirteen thousand dollars so it was it's not small peanuts to the city either so um, and we have to pass these audits in order to be able to continue to get, to get that the funding funding so excellent uh, yeah that's cool excellent you bet. All right. Um, the last item on our agenda is um, item 13 is tavern activities, compliance checks, and law enforcement activities. Um, you see the report within the packet. Um, anything that you have questions on for the chief or anything that, go I ahead, do. Becky. I have a question, chief. I know when we give bartenders license, we always talk about over serving and, and that. Is there a measure that you look at? I, I see a, an incident in here that really has me kind of concerned. When somebody comes in at 9 o'clock, or the bartender does, and somebody at 1041 had three shots of 100 proof and two pints of vodka and orange juice and ended up uh, being um, escorted by ambulance, I, you know, I, I just wonder, is there is there, like, some specific, or is it just, is it just the you know, a general uh, a sense of, well, you know, like common sense. I just wondered about that. I, it just bothered me. Yeah, I mean, I think those types of cases are, um, they're individual just like every criminal case that we go to and we have to, uh, I mean, our night shift officers are very aware of our, our bar ordinances, our tavern ordinances, especially as they relate to over serving or serving, uh, you know, while they're impaired and, and they're always, uh, Thinking about those things and going through the going through those questions, um, it's not an easy ordinance to enforce necessarily because you know you have to know that uh, somebody's specifically being served, who's being served, what did they know at the time, what was the uh, what were the actions and demeanor of the the patron within the bar, and those types of things. Um, so. Uh, you know, those are the types of questions that officers go through for those types of situations and investigations. Go ahead, Pat. Might be easier. Um, <laughs> not that hard questions like Becky asks. <laughs> um, the uh, incident at Denmark said officers from the CRU responded. What's a CRU? That's our community resource unit. So our, our community resource officers that uh, do a lot of drug investigations um, and, uh, and those types of prostitution investigations, those kinds of things. Okay. And I thought it was interesting that m and uh, station had uh, an incident apparently involving intoxication at 11, 12 a.m. Ouch. Um, uh, no one know the pints of vodka. I wonder if that, like, a, if that wasn't serving of vodka or... I think that was a typo. Uh, that was an, a nighttime event, actually. It was 11, 12 p.m. I, I talked with uh, oh, that was the owners at okay. MNR regarding the that incident. The not correct. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a night, night shift incident. I can stop scratching my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that said, I mean, that's something we always look for on the report as a pattern. And if we see a pattern of over-serving, which, you know, we had some places where it was abundant and it was happening all the time, you know, where we knew the people were being carried out to cars and whatnot. And I mean, they're not in business anymore. But I'm glad you brought up the one about the, you know, what, I mean, we always looked at the equivalent of an alcoholic drink being either, you know, a, a shot of something, a mug of beer or a mixed drink. And so, you know, just by the narrative of what this particular person consumed, she had five of those in an hour and a half. So, you know, that, dangerous. right. So if there's a definition of over serving, that's probably it. But, you know, we don't have a long history with the establishment either. So I think that's something that, you know, they too need to take stock of. Yeah. So, because it, it catches our attention, that's for sure. Um, anything else that you wish to talk with the chief about? If not, we'll place his report on file. And uh, that item was the last one on the agenda. The last item is communications. I have none. Does anyone else have any? 
I was just wondering, did you guys have anything? You stayed through the whole meeting. It's I just like to listen. We, because, because we are so entertaining. I did see... <laughs> I did see, that's right, and our guests tonight are the owners of the Whitewater Music Hall, and I did read that your first show has been booked, so. The, the first public show. We have first public the show? Sooner, I mean, the sooner than that, but they were really excited to start the market. Good stuff. Yeah. We're excited. If they go back over there, they're just going to have to work, so this is like a break. Oh, see, that's <laughs> it. That's it. So they can go back and say, oh, that meeting took forever. I'm sorry we're late. No, you know, so. Those pro quo. Well, when it we is. get done with work, we should be go over well, there. Well, I guess that's yeah. maybe, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I think if no one else has communications, I don't either. So a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. Motion by Herbst. Is there a second? Second by McElhaney. Members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. We'll stand adjourned then. Thank you, everyone.